What's the best way to pray about our unbelief? That's what we're going to talk about in Mark 9. Okay, so we had quite a conversation about taking up your cross. And do we think that this is going to get better for us now that we're in Mark 9? So then Jesus tells them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. That's going to happen when Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He is going to come back to earth in full power. Right now, he's not using all his God powers. He can do anything he wants to do. Anytime he wants to do it, he wouldn't have to walk places. He could pop places here and there, but he is holding back his power. I thought it was interesting. I was listening to, because I'm trying to, you know, figure all this out. And I, someone asked the question, why does God withhold his power from himself? Couldn't he have done many more things? Why doesn't God come in full power to help us or do something amazing? Someone said that God stands back from us a little bit by not showing himself to us in the same way, by not doing some of these things in the same way to give us free will. If God just came here in full-blown power, did all the things, ordered all the things, didn't involve us in his ministry at all, we'd be lacking in our own free will to do anything. Because obviously, if God is in full power, we're going to do anything this power says, right? Aliens came down and they had amazing weaponry. We would do anything they said because we're scared to death of them. That is not what God is seeking. God is seeking a relationship. So he said that you're going to see me in full power, the kingdom of God, And that's what's going to happen after the resurrection. So then it says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them to a high mountain. It's interesting. He always takes Peter with him wherever he goes. And James and John too, the sons of thunder. Because we just got Peter being yelled at, (laughs) Peter rebuked and then got rebuked back. Jesus rebukes people or he says the honest truth to them about what they're not doing correctly. That is not a, I'm mad at you and now you're no longer my favorite. God wants us to interact with us. He wants us to bring to him our bad opinions so he can help us correct our bad opinions. He's not going to just tell Peter, well, you're a moron, get away from me, or you're impetuous, get away from me. He is going to bring Peter closer to him. So he leads him up to the mountain. We heard this in Matthew. They were transfigured. This word is a little bit different. In Matthew, it was more about him shining like a white light, but it says this case it's transfigured, meaning he changed his appearance and his clothes became intensely white. That it was the light, and I thought this was interesting, that no one on earth could bleach. Speaking to people who would understand that, the Romans would understand there is a kind of white you cannot create on earth, and that's what this was. That's when he sees Elijah with Moses. Romans, again, are not going to be familiar with that. So there's more explanation here. And they're not really going to understand to the same degree who those two people are. So we don't go into much depth. But it says that they were talking to Jesus. People in the commentaries will talk about, what were they talking about? I think they were going, man, Moses is like, you know those people? They just sit there and gripe and complain and they never learn, do they? And Jesus is like, no, they never do. And Elijah's like, yeah, I tried to. It just never works out. No one ever listens they never do. That's, that's what I think that they were. Of course, we don't know. But then Peter says, you know, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three. In this case, it says tents, meaning it was more like tabernacles. That's what Moses walked through the desert with, which means we're going to carry all these people with us because we want everyone, I think, to see. I think Peter's idea was, oh my goodness, this is just amazing. Now we have this amazing rabbi. I think he's the Messiah. But now we have Elijah and Moses too. We're going to walk around. We're going to cruise around all this area and we're going to show people Elijah and Moses with Jesus and then they're going to get it. And so I think his leanings were good about putting them in a tent. I mean, obviously it was, people laugh and said it was a foolish request. And it even indicates he said it because they were all terrified. So he didn't really know what to say. And then that's when the voice comes out in the clouds. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Get listen. If you have ears here, if you have eyes, see. God the Father is saying, listen. They look around, and there's just Jesus there. It's a very simple story. It, it was much more elaborate in Matthew, but this is very simple. And I think the Romans would have found this amazing because 
God, the God, not just a Roman leader calling himself God, not just one of our minor gods that we bring to offerings and various temples and stuff like that, but the God on high recognizes Jesus as his son. Wow. And to have this big event. So they come down and he tells them, you know, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the son of man has risen from the dead. You see, they should have picked this out. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. <laughs> okay, we've said this a number of times, people. So it says, quote, why do the scribes say, the studiers say, that first Elijah comes? And Jesus is like, Elijah did come first to restore things, repent, turn around. And how it is written that the Son of Man should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But you know what? Elijah did come and they did to him whatever they wanted. And so they were like not getting it. And they're like, no, no, no. You came first and then Elijah came. And what he's saying is John the Baptist is your Elijah. This prophecy is not about Elijah, the human being. It is about an Elijah-like figure who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. That was John the Baptist. You just didn't see it as that's what he was doing. But Elijah was here. His name was John. Now, again, people wondered if John the Baptist was Elijah, but when they looked at the transfiguration, they didn't say, oh, look, there's John the Baptist. You know, this is clearly two different human beings. I think it also indicates quite clearly that the first time during the baptism of Jesus, when the voice said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, the reason everyone thinks nobody heard that was because look how terrified they are. They are beside themselves because of all of this. I think they said they fainted in Matthew or they went you know, down on the ground. They were so scared. Obviously, that didn't happen during the baptism of Jesus. And if this would have been the second time, they would have been a little bit more prepared for it. So most everyone believes that the first time this happened during Jesus' baptism, only Jesus could hear it. So they get downstairs and they see people are arguing and he's like, what are you all arguing about? And someone from the crowd says, you know, I brought my son. I wanted him to be healed from the spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down to the ground. He foams at the mouth. People wonder, is this like epilepsy? Is this a disease or is the spirit? Why not both? He said he had a spirit that makes him mute. Epilepsy doesn't necessarily make you mute, so he probably had a spirit and he had an illness. So then Jesus is kind of angry again at this point. You know, again, Mark is a little bit more negative and he goes, faithless generation, how long am I going to be here? Well, we know it's not really going to be long. How long am I going to bear with you, put up with you? How long is it? So bring him to him. And then when the spirit saw him, the boy, you know, started convulsing again. And Jesus asked him, well, how long has this been going on? Oh, you know, since childhood, forever. And not only that, this spirit keeps trying to throw him into water and fire. This kid's going to get more injured because he's going to get damaged from that. If you could help us, you know, please do. And Jesus says, if I can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. I always thought this was interesting. I always just been intrigued by this statement. Why would you contradict yourself the next moment? And isn't it true of a lot of us where we say, I believe, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Help me with my unbelief. Maybe our unbelief is about other things. I mentioned a few times ago that when I first became a Christian, I said, you know, I believe in Jesus. I do. I believe he came. What was hard for me to understand was everlasting life. You know, I didn't get that at all. And I would pray to God, I don't know anything about this everlasting life. I don't really know that you're going to do it, but it is still wonderful for me to believe you exist and that you love us. But believing in heaven, I don't know. That was just such a weird thing to me. I just didn't even get it. And I think too, that's where we can say, I believe, help me with my unbelief. I think that's just such a wonderful request. So then the crowd comes, he rebukes the unclean spirit and comes out of him. Never enter him again, crying, convulsing, and then the boy goes still like a corpse. He's dead. Everyone's like, he's dead. Jesus takes him by the hand and he gets up. Did the boy die? And Jesus raised him from the dead too? Don't know. 
but Jesus cured the boy. And the apostles were like, well, wait a minute, how come we tried to do this and we couldn't get anywhere with them? You know, because while well, James, John, and Peter are up on the mountain of transfiguration, there's still nine other dudes down there, apostles, who could heal. You know, they'd been healing people. They'd been, you know, doing these things. And Jesus says, this is not the kind that can be driven out by anything but prayer. You know, so did they not pray? Did they go through motions without praying? Interesting. The other point that people will bring up is, well, when did somebody pray? Jesus didn't say a prayer at that moment, or at least didn't indicate that he did. And what they're saying is that when the Father said, I believe, help me with my unbelief, that was the prayer. It was the Father's prayer who brought about healing for his boy. Again, we don't know. Maybe it was just Jesus praying, but somebody prayed and did the thing that needed to happen. Jesus again tells everyone about his death. They went on, you know, so then they leave there and they go back to Galilee, their home base. And, and it says that he was teaching his disciples, but he didn't want anyone to know. So he says, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, I mean, Jesus. And when they kill him, he'll rise again in three days. And they didn't understand it. It was just said that they were afraid to ask. You know, they've been with him so long and been through so many things and they're still afraid to ask. Isn't that just disappointing? You ever have that happen where you lay something out to someone, you tell someone something, and they just don't even know what to say at that point? These are the very people that should be talking to him. And knowing him, these are his apostles, but still not getting it. And we're not going to get it some more. So when they come to Capernaum, they go to the house and Jesus says, hey, you know, what were you discussing along the way? And they kept quiet because they didn't want to say the things that they were going to say. And so he sat them down. He brought them together. Okay, let's chat this out. But the reason that they were silent is they were arguing who's the greatest. You know, so we start seeing more and more of this picture, right? We know that it was John and James's mother, who was one of the disciples, one of the followers of Jesus, asked this for her child. But now that we know that they were arguing about it with one another, So this picture gets a little bit bigger. And he says, you know what? Anyone who would be first must be the last and the servant of all. And then he took a child who was among them, holds him in his arms. He says, quote, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me, God the Father. You are are taking in God when you accept me and when you accept a child you're taking in me. So we got a chain going on there. This is a challenge for everyone. And again, people don't get it because first of all, children, unless you were the son of a Roman emperor, didn't mean much, you know, in this culture. But this is Jesus bringing that children matter and that you should be the servant of everyone. Being the greatest is not about being in charge. And to the Romans, I'm sure this blew their minds because who's important? The emperor, the prelates, the governors, the warlords. That's what was important. It was men of action, men of high position, men men who were born into high position. And now what you're saying is it's not that. It's about being a servant. Soldiers, I think, in the Roman Empire probably understood they were nothing. They were fodder. They were pawns in military games. They're supposed to guard this thing and guard that thing and make sure no one comes in here, no one comes in there. And many of them were slaves, were captives from the land. So as soon as you go in and you sack an area, you would then take young children, and the Romans would take young boys and turn them into soldiers because they didn't have much allegiance to their country that just got sacked because they were too young to know. And in this case, this must have meant something to them because, first of all, their childhood mattered. Them as children mattered. I wonder how many, how old some of these people were, and they would realize this is a different kind of kingdom. This isn't a kingdom of Augustus Caesar. This is a kingdom of a child. This is a kingdom of a servant. So then John, the apostle John, came to them and says, you know, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons, and they were doing it in your name. And we told him to stop because he's not one of us. We don't even know who this dude is. And Jesus says, don't stop him. No one who does mighty works in my name will be able to speak evil of me. For one who is 
not against us is for us. It's a little bit different than what we hear, right? If you're not with me, you're against me. In this case, if you're not against me, you're with me. And he says, quote, I truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. We are not going to split them versus us. Boy, I tried to think of ways of describing this, and I think he just says it best. It's so funny. I keep saying this. It's funny how Jesus can say like two sentences, and then you can spend 40 sentences trying to explain it. People will oftentimes call the kingdom of God the upside down kingdom because it isn't how it works now, right? If you're not with me, you're against me. That is not what Jesus says at all. Isn't that great? Again, reading about what people thought about it. And someone named France, I don't know the person's first name, that disciples are called to be cautious and drawing lines of demarcation. They are to be a church, not a sect. We're not going to sit there and build these little cults, right? That we're not building a small organization just with us. And and only we're going to do these things. Instead, we're building a community of church brothers and sisters. And so we're going to leave God's judgment to him. We are not going to tell people that they can't preach, that they can't do the things God called them to do, because they're not exactly like us, or they didn't go through our exact schooling or our path, you know, those kinds of things. I think it's important for us to realize that many people can do the will of Christ and not be inside our own little circle of Christians. He goes on to say then, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for a great millstone to be hung around his neck and for him to be thrown in the sea. So there were two sized millstones, one kind of like a tiny gear and one for smaller things. And the great millstone was the bigger one. Again, goes into this, and we've seen this in Matthew, that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. This whole passage is not telling us to cut off our limbs, to rip out our eyes. It is just more about the importance of avoiding sin. We flirt with sin all the time. Well, it's kind of a little lie. Well, I'm just doing this one thing. No one will see me. That person in college I knew who would go out and have a complete blowout of her moral life and then just say, well, I'm going to go on Sunday and confess it. Sin is important and it's serious and we should not be light about it. And he's telling us how serious we should be. In Mark's edition of this story, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye and two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So that's kind of confusing, but that is essentially meaning hell where their worm does not die. Who's their worm? You know, that is going to be the worm of evil. And it, does, it never dies. The evil never dies. And it says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. If it loses its saltiness, how will it be salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Boy, this is confusing. We heard in the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, him talking about losing your saltiness. But what does it mean here when he's talking about that? So first of all, the commentaries mentioned that anytime you sacrificed anything to God, it was salted. I think it means that it's a purification. You know, when you salt something, you know, if you have a sore throat, right? You take water, you put salt in it, and you gargle with the salt water. Why? Because it purifies. It cleans out corruption from a thing. And so when you salted it, people salted food to keep it from rotting. Fire, too, also purifies whatever it is attached to. We purify meat by cooking it. So also another purification. The gist I get out of reading many of the commentaries is the gospel is that purifying salt and fire. It will cleanse us and the gospel will bind us together. One of the things we talked about before is how does salt lose its saltiness? It gets dispersed. It gets watered down. And so this makes me almost wonder if he's talking more about the believers together, that together they will have that gospel binding them together, purifying them together, holding them together, because at the very end, it says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. If we lose our saltiness as a people because we get too spread out, Imagine we're the body of Christ and we're inside of a salt shaker and I go to the top of a very tall building and I fling it out into the air. 
we're so dispersed, we're so far apart from each other, we're no longer at peace with each other, no longer bound together as a people, you can't find the salt again. You can't find our saltiness again. There's no way to restore it. You can't add more salt to salt. So just this phrase that's a little bit different, where it's just talking about how the kingdom of God is not separated. Those who are with us are with us. And together, we're salt. And we're very salty when we're together. We're very purified. We're very cleaned by the gospel as a salt shaker. And then if we lose it, we get dispersed. We get drowned out. Be purified. Keep your saltiness. Get that fire and be cleansed sacrifices were salted. Sacrifices could be burnt at an altar. They're cleansed. And salt is valuable. It adds to the flavor of life, not just purification. And so in the end, it says salt is good. I agree. Salt is good. So my meditation for this week is going to be that about the sin. Take sin that seriously. Are there sins that I have that I take not very seriously? I'm going to have to think about that. It's so easy when we live in the society that everything is going at us a million miles a minute. It's so hard how fast time can go for us. Sometimes time flies so hard that we can commit a sin, that we can allow ourselves something that we shouldn't be allowing ourselves, and then we're on to the next thing. We're on to the next thing. Sometimes I think we don't take sin in its proper place because we can just go on and think about the next thing. My prayer this week is going to be about how people who are not against us are for us, that we can be accepting of other people who are not us, whatever we decide us is, that in the kingdom of God, in our church, we have so many different people, and we have to remember that. And what I'm going to share with other people is that prayer that the man with the demon-possessed child said, I believe, help my unbelief. I want people to know that they can ask God to increase their belief. They just don't have to sit there in whatever state their faith is in. Well, I kind of believe, but not really much. You don't have to sit there. You can tell God, I believe, help my unbelief. Just amazing. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to tell a friend. Tell your Bible study. Tell people in your church. I'm happy also that if you ever want to have a conversation, with your Bible study group or talk about something, let me know. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you and have a wonderful day.